a good long drive from Manhattan, but I really don't know where. It was in a charming old cider mill that a couple was refurbishing to be uh, their home. And it hadn't quite gotten to this point of civilization as yet. There was like one bathroom, one light over the sink, everything else uh, was hauled in. You know, we took a candle to bed at night. It was, it was very primitive. But that, of course, is what forced the, the, the look of the film. Not forced the look of the film. The look of the film uh, was enhanced by and I don't know how or where they found the place, but it was, it was uh, another stroke of genius. As there were many strokes of genius in this, starting with Jerry's concept, even though it got bent a little as we began to work on it. It wasn't, of course, the, the first film that he had in his head, but he was, was, has confided to me since that he couldn't have been more pleased with the way it uh, evolved. Boy, did I do backstory. Boy, did I do preparation. Boy, did I try to remember everything I had heard at every acting lesson I had ever been to. This was my big shot. This was my chance to shine. This was to do something real. Of course, I was totally in, enraptured in all of this and figuring it out these things for all of the two days that I had leading up to this. And then, kaboom, we're shooting. And thank God I didn't have time to go back and do a lot of reflection. I love what, uh, God, was it? Dustin Hoffman, Dustin Hoffman said, you know, acting is fine when you're in class, but when you're in front of a camera, the clock is ticking. You don't, you don't have time to act anymore. <laughs> you do the job. <laughs> God bless them. The suicide scene that was shot in Manhattan was shot on a Sunday morning just for the sound, sound purposes, just because that's the quietest time in Manhattan. It was technically the most difficult thing to do, just to hold your eyes open that long. Not easy. Uh, how I prepared for it was, oh, right out of Stanislavski. I just spent the entire morning remembering every horrible thing I could have about my life. Just, you know, oh, every poor me story I could come up with. I just rolled in it. I wallowed in it all morning. And I was just so suffused with all this self-pity that by the time we got to the thing, I didn't really have to do anything. I did nothing. I was, I was miserable. I just stood there and was miserable. <laughs> I'm so sorry for myself. Uh, and it worked. It worked beautifully. Um, Again, I got to give Jerry credit for being a hands-off director when that was right and a hands-on when that was right. He was, his instincts are just infallible. And he just, he just let me roll until he needed something. And then he, he was in there with, with what it was. He, could make, he, he communicated so well. He could tell me exactly what, what was needed. And it really spoiled me rotten. <laughs> he really did. Harry Reams was a, just a pixie. When I first met Harry, uh, I went over to his house to uh, see about getting this job. Walked in and Harry's there in this outrageous Italian shirt and his shorts and he's carving a jack-o-lantern. And I looked at him when he first poked his head out the door to see who was there. Here was this mustache that went on forever, this rather prominent but very attractive nose, and these twinkly eyes. If he'd have had the dark rimmed uh, glasses on, he would have been the perfect porn character that you see in all of the comics of a porn character, you know, where they put the nose and the glasses on for a disguise. But he was so cute, 
and so funny, and we had such a good time carving that jack-o'-lantern and then getting to and from the set and on the set and everything. Uh, he was he was a Boy Scout, and as far as a sex partner on in front of a camera, uh, Harry, Harry was just the best. He was so considerate and so careful to never. Uh, get you know too too eager too anxious get a, he was always very considerate and that goes a long way when you're doing sex scenes in front of the camera it's the one thing they will not forgive i'm sorry but there's nothing i can do then why all this why the interview if there's no point it seems a hell of a waste of oh, excuse me i didn't mean it's quite all right Many ways I concur. I mean, it's not as though I were on a commission basis. It makes no difference to me which way they go. My job is simply to ease the journey. The uh, John Clements, who played Mr. Abaca, was a consummate actor, a fine actor. He forced me first in the reading that I did with him, that got me the part in the first place, and then in the scenes that we did, he forced me by his intensity and integrity to come up to a level that was acceptable. And I'll be forever grateful to him. <laughs> Whatever his real name is, <laughs> I never did know. Okay, you wanted to know about Claire Lumier. Claire Lumier, who uh, was in the film. Uh, Claire was my roommate. Um, she was a little hippie gal on her way to Alaska, running away from home when I met her at a peace march. And I said, why do you want to go to Alaska? And she said, they got a lot of jobs there. I said, they got a lot of jobs in Hawaii, too, <laughs> you know. Come on, come, over, come stay at my house tonight and think this over. Three months later, I get into the pickle factory in order to help find her a place to live and uh, try and get her interested in earning a living in some manner or other. Um, and she'll be the first to tell you that that was not going to take care of her. She still doesn't learn to live. But she's a very fascinating woman. She's, uh, she's a philosopher. She's a philosopher. And a very interesting person. We stayed together for about two years after that film was made. And then, um, I discovered that I was a closet heterosexual. There was just no getting around it. And she went her way with uh, a group of birds of a, her birds of a feather, and uh, I went mine. Mark Stevens was a very dear friend. Mark Stevens saved my ass, saved my life, literally.